I don't know what they're smoking over there at Princeton. I'm white and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got everything I need. I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree. And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me. And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee. Just like my straight white male dad did to me. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got all the luck I need. I've got a pile of broken mirrors and I'm walking under ladders and I'm spilling tons of salt. But to me that doesn't matter because my skin and my gender and my orientation are the best things to have if you live in this nation. I recommend it highly. See a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree We do the show live every Wednesday at 7pm Pacific Right here on Twitch That's twitch.tv slash echoplexmedia and uh, make sure you're following my DJ channel. That's uh, David Boohow. I don't know. Spell it wrong. Maybe Twitch will find it for you. Maybe it won't. Uh, the bot will tell you about it eventually, I think. I um, mean, support this project at uh, patreon.com slash echoplex or even better at eplex.store. Sign up for five bucks and you get all of our uh, podcast recordings, the audio and video of them in your inbox the next day. That's the day before the pods come out. Uh, plus, if you sign up at eplex.store, you get a discount on all of our uh, great merch. And um, we have a new shirt. It's uh, a picture of a cat that says, tell your kitty. I said, pss, 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 pss. and I, uh, <laughs> I think once we actually start um, trying to market that shirt and the other products that I'm coming up with, I think it'll do quite well. Anyway, I'm producer Dave. It's hot in the studio and you can find me on Grinder. And I am HK Perrin. You can find me on Mastodon at hparin at port87.social. Uh, and it is hot in my place as well. <laughs> Uh, it's it's warm enough that I can't use color correction to make my face a little less pink because it just washes everything out. So people are just going to deal with pink, Dave. <laughs> I could change my light. My light's pink. Would that no, no, help? no, no, no. We're going to do it. We're going to do a podcast right now, I think. Um, so we're watching something called Council of the Cancelled <laughs> because, of course, we are. And wouldn't you know it, Eric's, Eric's on the Council of the Cancelled. Uh, I don't know who these other people are. Uh, the one on the left looks familiar to me, but we'll, I'm sure we'll find out about them. Or maybe not, because they've been canceled. I wish I was as lucky enough to get canceled like Eric. Of the canceled. And somehow whenever yeah, I to be a millionaire, I now have a positive sense of, oh, what did they say? You know, I wrote this thinking, okay, I'm not, I'm not really representing the, ma the majority opinion, but a really respectable minority opinion. They weren't disgraced until you called them disgraced, and then everybody looked around and said, oh, they're disgraced? They're probably disgraced. But we're sitting here looking metacognitively at our own minds, doubting ourselves, and the, the power to convene these things we're sharing the same story. I have a feeling Schoolhouse Rock might be canceled after this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's we'll just update the <laughs> yeah. episode. This music sounds like it's for a cooking show, right? Like like when they're preparing the ingredients before they make like the best sandwich that, that you've ever seen, but that also costs more than to just go, go to the sandwich shop and buy. Mm -hmm. It's it's very, it's very, very, the music was very... Don't forget to follow us on social media for beautiful food and inspiration. I uh, like it definitely were... doesn't sound like they're trying to portray themselves as, which is like controversial. Right. It sounded like they were going to show us the cutest tiny house in the world. <laughs> yep. I'm Nicole Shanahan and welcome to the Council of the Canceled, where free speech prevails. 
Today, we bring together a group of prominent experts who share one thing in common. Their work has been censored and their integrity questioned, all because their findings challenge the status quo. Yeah, but the, I bet the difference between these other two is these other two don't claim to have unified physics by themselves on the back of a napkin at a bar in their spare time. <laughs> I mean, these other two people are probably fucking ghouls too, right? But the, 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 the level of the claims that they're making is probably going to be slightly less intense than what Eric has claimed to do. Potentially. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, like, I, th I think you're right. That's probably the most wild claim you could make. Together, we can shed new light on their perspectives and learn from their insights, no matter how inconvenient they may be to those who wish to silence their voices. Welcome to the Council of the Cancelled, a idea that has been born uh, from several of these conversations and realizing that... Damn, $2,000 worth of mics and about $3 worth of ideas. ...much a trend at hand, <laughs> and that there's enough of us that maybe it's time for us to have these conversations in larger groups than one-on-one, -on -one, where we just are being interviewed, telling our story from our own personal standpoint. I think we now realize there's a wider issue, not just nationally, but globally. And many, many expert voices have been silent. What does that mean? Many parents have been- I don't know, but the, uh, the portable air conditioner that doesn't have a hose going to the window so that it's blowing cold air out the front and hot air out the back is probably actually a good metaphor for the thing we're watching. If I'm going to be completely honest. <laughs> yep. Silence. <laughs> There's a whole mechanism that we're realizing is at play to silence opinions that are dissenting against the status quo. Yeah, I, I feel like um, uh, but, and, and these Eric seems like the kind of person who would be so out of touch that he doesn't know how an AC works. These are very serious things, but I want us to set a vibe for this. And I think the vibe should be light and joyous and productive. Well, you gotta at least make Eric leave. Because <laughs> we've been in the middle of it in our own lives for quite a while. And there's some joy now in sitting together in a group and actually talking about what we're gonna do next. So here I am in our first um, council with Jay Bhattacharya, Eric Weinstein, Mike Benz. Many of you know them, follow them. They have been incredibly inspirational. They have been up against the- Is that another AC or is that like a platform dehumidifier? Re-platform thing. I think they're both portable ACs. To X. Um, and so today- we got a lot of stuff going on in this room. Where we are gonna unify some of the common threads that we have been talking about. Um, this is so now I know who two of them. Jay Bhattacharya is like a fucking COVID grifter. Eric is just like an all-purpose grifter. And I didn't catch this other guy's name, actually. She kind of went over it real quick. It doesn't seem that their names are in the title. Right now as a decentralized, multi this is bespoke reseeding of representative experts. <laughs> so here we go, guys. I mean, how are you feeling right now? How many times have you been told you're anti-science today? <laughs> I mean, what I want, Nicole, is that uh, there should never have to ever be another council. Does that mean that they're canceled, though? This is really, really weird. Um, I don't think any of them have been canceled. They're more popular than they've ever been, except for the guy on the right whose name I don't know. Maybe he actually got canceled. Maybe he, like, worked at an old <laughs> Navy and folded the clothes wrong and got fired. Nobody ever thinks about that poor, poor motherfucker when they talk about being canceled, do they? <laughs> I would imagine that, like, if you're going to say that you're canceled, it's more than just, oh, someone said something mean about, about, you know, my grift. Run in a way. You know, like, so that like you've been kicked off of Twitter or something, you know. Institutions welcome the kinds of dissident voices that have been shunned aside during the pandemic and else. It is also kind of funny that, uh, I don't remember people using the word grifter and charlatan outside of like a, I don't know, an 1880s vibe. That well, you guys brought it back, friendo. <laughs> this is your, <laughs> go look at the mirror. You are the reason. Yep. 
those were fighting words where you'd fight a duel. And somehow whenever I hear somebody's a grifter or a charlatan, I now have a positive sense of, oh, what did they say? What's their perspective? Have they written anything I can read? And I don't think that that was the uh, initial intent of these campaigns against such people, but it is backfiring in kind of a humorous way. Right, yeah. it's the same thing with science. I mean, when someone's called anti-science, I think, oh, they, they must know their stuff. What, what can I learn from this anti-science person? Because if the science establishment is against them, then they clearly have ideas or research. But wait a minute, this is just pure contrarianism for its own sake, right? This isn't like, yeah. this isn't like one of those, like, oh, show me the money. It's like, I'm not going to believe that you have any money, even if you show it to me. <laughs> like, science says that it's bad to eat parasite eggs. But, you know, this guy over here is anti science. You know, people call him a grifter because he sells all these parasite eggs for people to eat. And it just so happens that, like, you know, some of the people that eat them are still alive. And they talk about how great they are. Are not being allowed in for a, for a reason. And this gets to something I think we were talking about before, which is about the, the really the self-destruction of trust in institutions that do the gatekeeping of ideas that provide, you know, sort of the consensus building architecture that ends up being implemented in policy or being implemented in public health or censorship decisions or government decisions. Notice they never have any problem with the stuff that gets implemented as a new iPhone, <laughs> better television, yep. faster vehicle. Or like, you know, exactly like I was saying, like, I, I'm pretty sure most of them would agree that you shouldn't eat parasite eggs. Maybe not the guy on the left. <laughs> but yeah, like maybe they would, you know, just cause like it's anti-science to, to say like, no, just cause like science says I'll have an 80% chance of dying if I eat this specific type of parasite. Those, tw those other 20% of people must be onto something. Yeah, they all seem to be so happy about it. And the fact that we're all talking about these labels as being badges of honor, that they must be right because the institute... And I, you know what? I haven't heard a single person tell me that it killed them. So I don't believe it. I don't believe there are those people. That they must be right because the institutions are opposed to them, I think gets to this question about what is the role of these institutions in our country, how they developed, how they lost that trust, what can be done now. And we hear this term democracy a lot. And I always, they always say these, these terms together, democratic institutions. And, and we were talking before that there's, I see there being two parallel tracks with the role of, of institutions in, in censorship and, and cancer. Is he talking about science? Because science is not a democratic institution. Just because most people believe something doesn't mean science, it's like scientific That's consensus. That's not what he's talking about, though. He's talking about like a public health agencies and whatnot, which are oh, also okay. like a, like a, but, a, those, but they're, they're, well, hold on. They're like a, they're like abstracted, like one abstraction away from democracy because a lot of those people are appointed by, or by your elected officials. Okay. So they're not, you don't vote on, you know, the HR person at uh, the fda so it's like abstracted yeah. it's abstracted it's uh oversight from uh elected officials yeah i i would say like even then like those specifically and explicitly and purposefully are not democratic institutions right these and these people get mad at them and call them the deep state because those people don't get fired every four years essentially <laughs> the media side which is people being gated out of Instagram or Facebook mm -hmm. or YouTube. Then there's the institutional side, which is people not being allowed to publish in you know, the National Academy of Sciences or in, or in, or in magazine or, or in, you know, the, in journals or in, uh, in government agencies. And oh, remember the good old days where you or I could just write something and the government had to publish it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So their idea of being canceled is just, I can't say something on these other people's platforms. Right. I mean, that's being canceled to them. There's a, I have some interesting insight into the, the, the psyche of, um, 
uh, anti like anti cult groups online yet i have not been published in the uh, most prestigious most prestigious psychological journals uh, at this point um, possibly because i have no credentials and um they they would have they would they, uh, my my work would probably be lampooned by actual experts but that'd be fun too because then i'd fucking learn something and i'd get them to come on my show and yell at me about my dumbass work and it'd be a lot of fun <laughs> Those two things, I think, intersect with each other, and they're each their own sort of problem for reseeding institutions to represent the people rather than a cloistered set of interests. The way that I think we can start with this conversation, and you said, let's just have one council, and then hopefully we don't have to have it again. That's real bad for her YouTube channel. In our brainstorm for this live session, we already started talking about how deep and how powerful these mechanisms are. And I just want to propose that I think we must continue these councils. There'll be different people, different voices, different backgrounds, different opinions that we will be convening until there is a proper reseating of experts. And so- um, hey, Would it be possible for you to turn down like the bit rate you're sending to me? Cause I'm getting a lot of, uh, of lag. Um, sure, I think, yes. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, we do the show live, everybody. <laughs> that we're trying something right now in this format. That is my hope being is something that lasts um, in, in many different iterations. We're open sourcing this format if others want to, to engage in it. But the ideal is, is that we either invite... Open sourcing this format? You can't close source a format. This is just four people complaining. This is the yeah. most. This is, this is the, not. This is, what, what is she talking about? It's a panel podcast. Like she didn't invent that. There are panel podcasts about open source already, <laughs> yeah. but they're not talking about their show. Well, I mean, all all podcasting ends up being self referential at some point, I suppose. But what is she? This is. This is like buzzwords. This is a, a, maybe nobody takes her seriously yeah. because she's just like misusing buzzwords. Yeah. Um, Dave, you and I open sourced uh, reaction content. We did. Or we will be restarting our. Actually, it's all Creative Commons, but I don't. I don't know how all that works when we're using someone else's non-Creative Commons as the as the source material. But I think this is transformative enough because I complain at you enough during the show that we've transformed the the whole thing. <laughs> and our institutions will be based on principles on how we reach expert consensus and infrastructure for reaching expert consensus. Um, so, Eric, I want to turn this one. Well, like none of these people are experts. Um, I think Jay Bhattacharya has domain expertise in, in his field. I think he's uh, some kind of um, medical, something medical. But, okay. But that's one person that doesn't mean that he's the consensus that's what these i think that that what yeah. what eric wants is for the what he says to be the consensus right like i don't know that yeah, much he, about the he others doesn't want the experts to have their say well the other experts the bad ones <laughs> yeah talked about what this infrastructure should look like how it how it has looked in previous formats um and and the risk of what happens if we don't Sure. I mean, one of the things that I, I think I was most moved by was... Oh, was he going to fucking make pretend that, that peer review didn't ex exist until like the 60s? That it came along with the Civil Rights Act? Concern that uh, by creating consens consensus in this new way of taking the dissenting portion of the expert community and deciding that they suffer from some strange psychological malady or uh, incompetence or that they're bizarrely self-serving... Uh, so that's what people say about you, Eric, but they don't say that about other people who just happen to get it wrong. <laughs> like there's tons yep. of people in every field of, of endeavor who get it wrong that everybody is just like, Oh, it looks like you got it wrong. And they're like, Oh shit, I did. They're like, what, here, let me see your work. Let me take a, Oh shit. Oh, good job. Hey, hold on. Let me, Hey, can, can I have that actually? <laughs> <laughs> I think you might be telling on himself a little right, bit. This, this seems, this seems oddly, oddly, oddly about him. Because, yeah, there's other people in the fields of physics and mathematics who have gotten it wrong. It's starting to look like 
so a lot of the stuff in string theory might end up uh, not panning out. And I don't think everybody's just going to call all those people a bunch of cranks and charlatans. Michio Kaku, they will. But that we've already done that. <laughs> but no, they just got it wrong because they're like on the they're like on the bleeding edge of knowledge. And they're going to get I think the, anybody on the bleeding edge of knowledge has to accept that they're going to get a lot of stuff wrong. Yep. Like there's I think he's just mad that people call him those things because he is those things. Um, the institutions have been running their own credibility into the ground, and you can see this across different disciplines in different fields through the polling data. How much confidence do you have in medicine, in journalism, et cetera? Even science, in particular, That's with disasters. Correlation, problems. not causation, though. Right. It it could be the the rise of conspiracism. It could be um, the rise of uh, people like Joe Rogan becoming hugely popular among. <clears throat> like middle class white guys in my age cohort because we're a pretty big part of the conversation now and <clears throat> it, it, but and like i think it depends on how you frame the question too because go do you trust science that's a fucking stupid question what do you mean <laughs> like that the question is yep. meaningless almost and if they say, do you trust all of the you know government science and public health institutions all the time i'm like not all the time and also, like, if if you asked everyone, do you trust, I don't know, the planet Jupiter? And, like, all of a sudden, within the last 10 years, far fewer people trust the planet Jupiter. It probably wasn't anything that Jupiter did. I don't know. You've seen the way it's been looking at us the last 10 years? <laughs> Health under COVID. Uh, I think that what you're trying to do is you're trying to say... Each time you buy a consensus by doing character assassination against dissenters, you're actually destroying the long-term uh, respect in that institution. How many people still feel the same way about UPenn, Harvard, and MIT, my three universities, after those disastrous testimonies before Congress? So what, you, what you're seeing, I think, is... Um, I, I, but I, most I, people don't even know that that congressional hearing happened and most people have a i have a generally neutral position and opinion on most universities because i don't really know much about them yep. i know that the universities he mentioned would tend to lead someone to making more money in their in their field uh, and that's about it actually plan your plan seems to be to offer the institutions a way back by saying here's how we would come up with a protocol for figuring out who are the stakeholders and the representatives of the public in the expert community that are being silenced um, or being maligned or pre-bunked or whatever crazy uh, terminology. We'll, we'll well, like, again, you know, Eric likes to pretend that he's part of the expert community, but he's fucking not like he's, he's a, uh, a finance guy. Like he's not, he has, experience in physics but he's not a physicist like he doesn't do physics as his job you know he's uh, a venture capitalist right he's like that guy like when i go to or a, a fucking, manager at a like when, I, when I go to a party and people find out that i'm a dj there'll be some guy who's like oh i used to be the biggest dj in the world and all this and i used to play this and that and this and that and this and that i'm like oh where do you play now <laughs> and a lot of the times the dude's lying about how influential he, and it was always a dude. You're never gonna run into a woman doing that. She'd be mm -hmm. like, Oh, I, I used to try to spin records. I wasn't very good at it, which is fine. Right. Or she'd be like, Oh, I used to spin some records. You know, we threw a few parties. It was fun. Like, <laughs> but he's like the, yeah, he's like the dude. He's like the dude at the party, like complaining about the DJ and saying that he used to DJ 15 years ago and that he would have rocked the discotheque at this party. But instead he's like fucking doing meth in the bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, and like you dig deeper and it's like he was never a professional DJ. Like he came out with some some weird material and everyone was like this is awful. And then he he started talking about how all the DJs, you know, how the the institution of DJism is not good. We need to I mean there there's some there's some problems in that in that industry, but <laughs> <laughs> definitely some problems in the industry uh, a lot of the same problems of the youtubers a lot of white guys a lot of white guys seems in a minute right so the, that's the, wild in essence what i see 
and this is your suggestion, maybe you're too modest to, 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 to sort of make it, is let's try to use the campaign to push the experts back into the institutions from which they were ejected. We know who these people are. You weren't are. ejected. Uh, you went and worked for Peter Thiel because the money was good. Nope. Or maybe he was, but he must have been fucking just insufferable to try to work with, too. Like... Uh, to the extent that he was ejected from academia, it's because he would not relent, like pursuing this idea that was thoroughly incorrect. So, and demonstrably so to be fair, so. to be fair, he he was he had long since left any association with any academic institution when he started working on uh, geometric unity. Okay, I don't know what his thesis was about or whatever. I don't know. Maybe he was real good. Maybe he was real good. Maybe he was, you know, maybe his papers like that he wrote before he uh, went, went and worked in the private sector were real good. I don't know. I just know that like he didn't get kicked out for uh, geometric unity. He tried to come back, but it's like trying to do your comeback and <clears throat> like it's trying to like you're a DJ and you're, you're trying to do your comeback and you uh, do it on a, a single cassette player and a crappy microphone and, and just explain to everybody that like they don't understand your vision and they should be dancing. <laughs> I've revolutionized the the entire approach by by using my my, walk my cassette player yeah. use, my, using my Walkman and one of those microphones that came with the old He Man castle. <laughs> <laughs> Are and they're quite good. They were trained in our institutions, and if that fails, um, then we have a plan B, which is that you grow the the camp. So e e either kill it or. or or grow it and you kill it by reseeding the uh, experts inside of the institutions. And if you yeah. can't kill it, uh, you grow it and you, you make sure that you have an alternate plan B. The thing that I'm realizing is that it's actually already quite big, but it's fragmented and not united. And that there's still, we're still in the storytelling um, information collection phase. And what I was really inspired by Jay, you said, 30,000 qualified doctors and epidemiologists and public policy experts signed your Great Barrington Declaration. I did not realize it was that many people. Yeah, I mean, almost a million regular people signed it, but the, many of the regular people are tremendously impressive. But uh, with the particular expertise in epidemiology, medicine, I think like 30, 30 yeah, something like 30,000 people um, signed it. Uh, what that tells but, me. Okay, so epidemiology is the study of virus of uh, an infectious disease um but medicine is a broad field right like the people involved in medicine like i had to, i got treated at a at a public hospital when i broke my arm and people there were great but i don't think any of them were an epidemiologist they all work in medicine probably that would include people like like an acupuncturist right oh or definitely included acupuncturists <laughs> okay yeah Sixteen thousand of them were acupuncturists. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I, I'm just making that up. Don't email me. Nicole, is that <laughs> uh, that it, the it, the center, which basically labeled the Great Barrington Declaration as a fringe idea, was not actually a fringe idea. Exactly. Uh, and in fact, I, I have to tell you, I myself was fooled about this point when we when just I because it, right? like tens of thousands of people believe something doesn't mean it's not a fringe idea, though. Right. And the, so for people that are listening that don't remember the great Barrington declaration was this thing that just said, let everybody get COVID and the fucking, the strong will survive. Essentially. It was fucking eugenics. That was the credit, like, no. <clears throat> you know, the criticisms of it from, um, people who are less inflammatory in their rhetoric than me were just like, well, this is, you know, this is bad medicine. This isn't how we stop the spread of diseases. This is you know bad science. Uh, but <clears throat> it was a eugenics and that was why it was probably so off putting to so many people. Yeah, it was like that uh, there was uh, some like senator representative in Arizona who was like, we should just let grandma die for the sake of the economy. It's that kind of thing. You tell all the individuals <laughs> Wait, that they are fringe? individually fringe <laughs> that they don't find each other. Yeah, exactly. So, so like I, you know, I wrote this thinking, OK, I'm not I'm not really representing the, ma the majority opinion, but a really respectable minority opinion back at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and now when I look back, I'm not so sure that that's true. Well, they're projecting. I mean, I really feel like in general, when somebody says fringe or charlatan or grifter or guru or ne'er-do-well or whatever, 
what they're really doing is, is that they're, they're telling you about the weakness of their position and trying to make sure that they strike first. To be honest, can we all admit that there's a little part of our brain that sits around saying, gosh, you know, so many bots said this terrible thing about me. Maybe it's true. And, and oh, no, it's that same. Remember fucking we we're watching Oh No Nora a couple weeks ago, and she said that the fucking people criticizing her don't show their face, that they're bots, that they're paid by Scientology. It's the it's the argument to Mad Madison Star Moonham, <laughs> where you're all you're most likely NSA agents, your bots, your trolls. Yeah. It's, it's everyone who criticizes me is not a real person, right? It's it's they all that's it's just like one of the you know we can't all be experts in everything, but as soon as somebody starts go, telling you that, you're like, oh, you're full of shit. <laughs> yep. And like I'm through this conversation, I'm becoming more and more convinced that Eric would eat the parasites. We know that this is a psychological defect that our brains weren't trained for an era in which you could buy 10,000 accounts that, you know, all scream the same thing. And yet um, we're sitting. Wait a minute. Then how do we know that, that somebody didn't just buy 10,000 fake epidemiologists or fake chiropractors for the signing of the Barrington Declaration? <laughs> Those were real people. They put their real name in there, and we would they go and background check everybody that signed this? You think like imagine that just background checking thirty thousand people that or so that are claiming to be medical experts signing your signing your open letter. Think of the think of the the amount of time and money that would take. They didn't do that. Why would they? cognitively at our own minds doubting ourselves and the, the power to convene these things we're sharing the same story where oh they got you too they got me on this and here's how oh, they use that language what it's only by creating an yeah. aggregate set of information that we learn what the techniques are. No, but we don't have that many words for con artist we have like con artist grifter charlatan snake oil salesperson um yeah i think those are like the four actually right i think i mean there are others but there's only four, four, like the four, those are the four main ones because I, because I'm in this space all the time and I see what people are, you know, the descriptions people use for people like Eric all the time. I guess somebody could be a hack, but I think that's falling out of, falling out of favor. We could probably come up with more, but yeah. But if so say we come up with, yeah, scammer, maybe we come up with like eight. Or ten. Well, yeah. Then you're going to have a lot of people using the same language to describe you. If you if if you are engaged in that sort of behavior, or people believe you to be engaged in that sort of behavior, language is limited, right? We only have so many fucking words. Like, oh, this tree running around. These people keep calling me a tree. <laughs> Pick up on one thing you said. I think it's super important. Um, the, the experts that we're talking about, what, what really what we're talking about is making sure that the people are represented in these institutions. These dissenting voices often represent regular people, regular, you know, uh, that, that, have been, that are hurt by the majority decisions. And so reseeding these institutions with experts, really what it means is it's, it's, it's putting the, the representatives of the people in the halls of power when the discussions are being made. I mean, that's partly my thinking with the Great Barrington Declaration, all these people were being hurt by these lockdowns, by these school closures at scale. The lockdowns yeah. didn't happen, school closures did. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on what he means by lockdowns. Like, what people mean when they say that is like the restaurants like either were closed for a few days or like had people sitting out on the curb. That was actually lovely in the, in the fall in Campbell, sitting out <laughs> on Pino's patio. And their voices were nowhere near the centers of power. They, they deserve to be. Yeah. And to me, I was, a, I was a representation of that group rather than just myself. That's why I was... Imagine if they took this same stance on everything, though. You know? Like, if, like, let's say, going back to, like, the, the seatbelt argument, if they were like, well, look at all these people who don't want to wear seatbelts and who you know, are adamantly against them, we, we should just, you know, no one should wear seatbelts. Then there would be so many more fatal accidents now 
because those people would have gotten their way. And like these people don't see that they are doing the same thing. There were um, people who were adamantly against seatbelts. The thing is that they didn't have um, some, they, they weren't able to organize around like a group of grifters because it was like harder to be yeah. a grifter before the internet, before social media. Yep. There were grifters though. L. Ron Hubbard being a famous one in the 20th century. Yeah, there's probably an anti seatbelt Facebook group. Oh, I bet there is. <laughs> <laughs> I we got I got a couple burner accounts. Maybe I'll check tomorrow. The anti seat <laughs> seatbelt Telegram. They're probably planning terrorist attacks in the anti seatbelt Telegram group. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but they would all they they might all they might all become unalive on the way because none of them wore their seatbelt. Yep. <laughs> Thinking okay, maybe I'm a minority. I thought no, no. There's these people. Regular people have a right to be heard in these when these decisions are made, and so that's why I was I was you know quite quite still quite proud of it. But we we traditionally have ways for the, like letters to the editor of newspapers. Uh, we have at the school board, a city council, county board of supervisors meeting. We have co public comment. You can write your senator. You can do all these things. Yep. But what they, I guess what they, I don't know what they, I think they just all want to be in charge and they're, they're, they're pretending yeah. that they're speaking for the average Joe. But I'm going to tell you, if I go to like, I don't know, I go to like a, like a union hall for like fucking like some trade, any trade, let's say carpenters. How many of those people know who the fuck Eric Weinstein is? Enabling <laughs> has a self-fulfilling prophecy aspect about it. You know, there's a there's a technique in markets where if a hedge fund wants to, you know, short a stock, uh, you know, they'll work with PR companies to create bad press about it, which will drive down the stock price, and then everyone will see the volume moving into shorts, and so other people will start to, you know, think the company is bad, or they will start to short it themselves because everybody else is shorting it, and so, it so that's actually illegal. But go on, a, a short worthy company because everyone's shorting it and i think there's the same thing with but that's that like built into that is the the fucking people that learn their lesson when everybody goes in and shorts the company and the company's stock does fine and then they lose a bunch of money shorting the company like a lot of yep. these short a lot, a lot and to be fair a lot of these a lot of these uh not necessarily if large institutions short something it's often to hedge against other investments that they have on the other side of the thing it's fucking stupid um, but but there's a lot of grifters, like grifter people who grift on the idea of like shorting companies. They're all over Twitter. There's a lot of like Tesla short grifters. Shorting is dangerous though, because it's it's like infinite risk. You know, you can lose an unlimited amount of money doing that. And so right. like I'm, I don't even know if that should be legal. Well, no, the the the, the not the basically trying to manipulate the market around something using the media when you have uh, a short position on something it's technically mm -hmm. illegal it's not like the fucking uh, sec is going to go after anybody that does that though yeah what i'm what i'm saying is like i don't even think shorting at all should be i wasn't legal. saying that it, that's illegal that it's, no. it's, it's 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 a part of the it's a part of the system what i was saying is that trying to manipulate the trying to manipulate the market when you hold a short position yep. on something is technically illegal not not in practice mind you <laughs> or even the nature of cancellation itself is people who are not yet deemed fringe or are not yet canceled by being by it, the public record saying that they are canceled that they are fringe they sort of become fringe because they were called fringe not because they were at, at the start of it and but isn't like isn't whether or not you're fringe sort of in the eye of the beholder, isn't it like a socially constructed yeah. <laughs> thing in the first place? Yeah. That's like, he's, he's describing how it would obviously work. Right. Yeah. You're not known as fringe until you're known as fringe, right? You could hold fringe positions and nobody knows who the fuck you are. And then like, nobody thinks <laughs> yeah. of you as a fringe person until you start becoming popular with your fringe uh, beliefs or as Madison would call them her French beliefs because she thought for some reason that we were saying that she had French beliefs the first time we talked to her. <laughs> you know, frankly, I think that's, that's part of the, the framing of saying that someone is a disgraced scientist or something. And it's like, they weren't disgraced until you called them disgraced. And then everybody looked around and said, Oh, they're disgraced. They're probably disgraced. And then by, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, how, that's yeah. how you become disgraced. That's, 
How does he not get that? That's how you become disgraced. That's how you become fringe. Like, yeah, like you're not fired until a company fires you. That's also how it works. But that's more concrete, right? You're not popular until everybody thinks you're popular. Yeah. <laughs> that's a little, you know, that's a little more in the realm here. You're not, you're not, you're not a grifter until everybody thinks you're a grifter. Now you're a grifter. Sorry. Yeah. Like these are things that he's talking about that are like projections of society onto you. So yeah, obviously they, they don't apply until society projects that onto you. Yes, that is how it works. Oh, there is this collective immune system. Response. Also, I'm still not sure who this guy on the right is starting to happen when those labels are thrown around because it's they've they've abused that so much and every time they do they lose institutional i think he's the guy that figures out all the things that everyone else already knows group says well oh, so he's like us in this case but dumber and then they look around and they say actually i don't i don't trust the national science foundation anymore i don't trust the national academy of sciences i don't trust tony fauci and and this idea on expertise i mean i think is embodied almost in this sort of great barrington de declaration versus Tony Fauci type thing where it, Fauci publicly declared that he was the science, you know, that it was not. Yeah, that was a bad move. He, he, he made a couple really bad missteps. And the one that they keep talking about, it was a bad move when he says, when you're disagreeing with me, you're disagreeing with the science. A better way for him to say that is be like, hey, you know, all I'm doing out here is really just, uh, you know, I'm a, a, a talking head for the consensus among experts. It's like, I'm now, uh, you know, he's like, now I'm a, I'm a member of the president's cabinet. I don't have time to do any research work. So now, you know, I'm not really speaking for Tony Fauci. I'm speaking on behalf of the consensus of relevant experts in the field would be like, you know what I'm saying? That would have been such a better way to put that than to, yes. to be like, I am the science. It's sort of like that. What was that? Judge Dredd where he's like, I am the law. You know, it's like, dude, <laughs> dude, no. It, that's his judge dread, judge dread moment of experts it was not people represented from all these different beliefs it was all like all the energies were just poured you know from this one sun Ra god who's come down to us in egypt and is and is saying i am the science and any scientist around me who opposes this is anti-science and and that works to pull off an emergency operation to to, to ram through something in the short term but almost like a like cancer, like it, the tumor cells spread from there in the institutions and people, people, it rules through fear and resentment, but that resentment builds and, and, I, and are they not using those? I'm getting the feeling that they're not using these mics that they have in front of them because this guy sounds, you know, the, the, the SM seven B sounds a certain way. Yeah, but it doesn't sound that way when you're talking like two feet away from it and it's pointed above you. Yeah. And you're not like talking into it yeah i guess you're right yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah like i sound a lot different now versus like now yeah yeah and if you're moving back and forth or if you're in an in-between space you're gonna be it's gonna be kind of in and out a little bit yeah yeah well i don't want to spend too much time on that that was my fault <laughs> this time actually it's a constitution, <laughs> and i think we have an exciting moment in history now where the, the opportunity to, to change that course is is here you know there's this this thing with an adjective, a profession, and then a proper name. So like fringe epidemiologist, Jay Bhattacharya. Uh, you had controversial professor Jordan Peterson. And when, when I figured out that this was... This is, uh, yes, yes, this is, this is, this would be, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> adjective. That is a description of someone, yeah. Yes, this is how you would describe someone. Um, unpopular podcaster, Gay Dave. <laughs> a formula because everyone who reads the New York Times knows the formula. I then did a search on controversial professor Paul Krugman. There was not a single hit on all of Google because even though he was a professor and he had been controversial, that formula is never applied to people who aren't in the crosshairs of the thing. So we are dealing with this much more developed uh, eco. Uh, architecture to take out dissidents. Yeah. And Nicole, you do have the coolest one, dangerous woman, Nicole well, Shannon. Well, so know. I have a few new tags <laughs> and um, they didn't start showing up until after I announced. The New York Times call her a dangerous woman? No, I don't think anybody called her that. I mean, somebody probably called her that, but that's Twitter. Because <laughs> like Eric was talking about the New York Times. <laughs> 
but um, uncorrelated. There's now these databases in which your name will be associated with all these tags, and those tags will be fringe, conspiracy theorists, dangerous, um, daily beasts. Yeah, pseudoscience, very common. Well, the um, great. the old saying goes, "If the shoe fits, right. wear it." So you know if. If those adjectives apply to you, yeah, you know, own them, I guess. And being controversial, be I, upset I, about them. I think controversy in and of itself, just the idea that there's controversy around something is kind of neutral. Yeah. Like, it's not necessarily that it's bad that you're talking about things that are controversial. It's like, it's more important, like, and I guess that's different, I guess, than saying someone is controversial versus saying that the topic they're discussing is controversial. I talk about controversial stuff on here all the time and, but nobody knows who I am. So oh, there we go. Grifter. We talked about that one, but I don't, I don't think that that's like an official Google tag yet, but you know, I've seen articles in which I'm in that have these tags under them. And I'm like, Oh, this is a database. This is preempted. This is not something extracted from a um, general algorithm. Somebody has my name on a list and that name is being associated with these tags. And those tags are going out with these major mainstream news articles. And um, I never seen this before, and I was I feel like, like people are just so tagging an article. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, yeah. <laughs> like when I tag things that are like on mainstream platforms or whatever, I'm not necessarily tagging for accuracy. I'm tagging so that I that people who would search for those things find my content. Yep. It's not dishonest, really, because they're tags. Bit of running an open internet. Um, but it's the re reality we live in. And you had described it as a digital scarlet letter in which you're walking around the real world, but everyone's looking at you and they, they not only, it's, it's not a visual tag, it's something deeper. It's a cognitive tag. And, and so let's get into that because Mike, you had shared. Yeah, that guy's name's Mike before we went live, um, this idea of not just reactively labeling individuals, but you can now preemptively do so through yeah. cognitive vaccines. Yes, yes. What? So, yeah, so this is this whole mad science. There's a whole field of the science of censorship, and it's totally rejuvenated the social sciences. You know, the, so the social sciences have always had a little bit of an envy, I think, of the... Of They're the starting to sound like... Uh, what is that uh, like targeted individual? Is that what it's called? Yeah. They and <clears throat> they're saying that they've been like so the idea of like pre-bunking or like inoculating people against misinformation and disinformation. It isn't about character assassination. It's generally about like <clears throat> people like me spotting things that are kind of coming up from the fringe that are starting to get popular in fringe areas and then mainstreaming those ideas in a within the proper context. So that if those ideas do become popular, normies, as if I'm reaching the normies, well, some of the, uh, some of the people that consume this content are normies, so that normies are already aware of what it is, where it comes from, and what the, like, what the underlying assumptions of it are, so that they <clears throat> aren't like blindsided by the fucking tunnel children. I mean... Yeah, I guess you're. He, I mean, I guess he's right. Is that it's it's an inoculation, but <clears throat> I think you know more importantly the the inoculation is is and I, I lean into this a lot, but the inoculation is more about patterns of behavior and uh, patterns of um, like patterns of thinking, ways of ways of addressing the audience, ways of interacting with communities that you can spot no matter what what level of expertise you have in what subject, where you can be like, ah, oh, this is a. This is a way in which this person's being, you know, manipulative of their community. This is a way in which this person is trying to toy with language. This is a way in which this person is trying to martyr themselves o over something minor so that people like attach themselves parasocially to them, like as if they're fucking Jesus and shit. And so <clears throat> I think that's the, the better inoculation. And I don't think these people are ever going to talk about that because one, I don't think they know what's going on anywhere. Um, but two, if they start talking about that stuff, they're going to have a big problem because they also try to inoculate people in the same way and, or in a similar way, but just in a different direction. Oh. Sense that 
you know, physics can be very accountable and chemistry. A lot of people associate that with real science and that there are sort of real social scientists, but a lot of it is, you know, just so stories or it's not really as, as hard and accountable. And that has started to change as in the, in the post-2016 environment when misinformation and disinformation became really sort of a, a government public policy initiative. It started to infuse all the universities and academics and researchers with, with hundreds of millions of dollars of grant funds that come from everywhere. They'll come from the National Science Foundation. They'll come from the, the, the Department of Defense or DARPA. They'll come from the state. Do they not department. see this as like a, a valuable effort to like try and combat misinformation? So what they I mean, their position here is that the, the government, I, th I think if I'm going to like give a, like a, cause this guy's not really good at explaining what he's talking about. Right. The, 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 the takeaway here or whatever, the position is that the government has a, a specific set of things that they want you to believe, and they're going to call everything else misinformation and disinformation. There's a way in which that's true, I suppose, but the thing is the people who are doing the best research on misinformation, disinformation, and uh, extremism, conspiracism, and whatnot, they don't work for the fucking government, dude. They're, they're like on Twitter, like asking you for 10 bucks so they can pay their rent. <laughs> I, mean, like, uh, I feel like the government could fund a lot of that research, like not necessarily like do it themselves, but you know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, the people that are doing the good work on that, I would I would suggest to you probably wouldn't want the government funding hmm. because okay. then then the paid government shell thing might stick a little bit better. <laughs> even even USAID grants and and Department of Homeland Security grants and uh, and this is nominally about about stopping the the spread of misinformation online which is sort of gets to the direct censorship side, but then there is a, a secondary field of research around the psychology of belief and, and wrong thoughts, which is um, if there is a government policy around public health, for example, vaccines might have adverse side effects. And the Department well, of Health they, and Homeland- They do, but they're rare and generally mild. And security will now yep. fund- And they list the side effects. effects. When you get the vaccine, like, Every vaccine I've ever gotten, I've got a sheet of paper that says, like, here are the known possible side effects. And they list out all the side effects. And they usually include things like headache, nausea, uh, allergic reaction, you know, all the things that could happen from taking pretty much anything. But does it list that your wife left you? Because that's what I found on VAERS. <laughs> it does not. I've, well, I've never noticed one that left that said that. <laughs> fund tens of millions of dollars to a coterie of universities who specialize in psychology, sociology. They'll work with data scientists to, to, to sort of, do, you know, do the, uh, the AI side of this. Linguistics. And, yeah, linguistics, computational linguistics is, is a big part of this. And, the, and the, des the design is that so that if you can't censor everything, you can collectively inoculate people from believing opinions the government doesn't want you to believe. This is not all that, you know, I sometimes jokingly refer to it as digital MK Ultra because it's sort of like this psychological control program. I, sir, I would encourage you to look up MK Ultra. There was a lot of, what he's describing doesn't have enough sex and drugs for it to be anything like MK Ultra. Honestly, MK Ultra was way cooler than what he's describing. Unless you were on the receiving <laughs> end of it and got acid without your permission and jumped out a window or got thrown out the window. Who knows? The jury's out but it's laundered with government dollars into universities. In the case we were talking about, it was the University of Cambridge, their social decision-making laboratory, which is you know, the study of how humans make decisions. Now they're funded by Google Jigsaw, which has its own sort of dark history, but they have direct partnerships. This is a, a British psychology lab that's partnered with the Department of Homeland Security here in the US, CISA, the notorious agency that, that was putting out videos telling children to report their own parents and family for disinformation if they questioned COVID orthodoxies. Our Department of Homeland Security- I'm not sure that that's true. And also with our State Department's global- I'm gonna go with probably not true. I have never heard of it, so I'm right there with you. Probably not true. I would have probably found it before you did because I am like at the bottom of every fucking rabbit hole. <laughs> Center, which was busted during the Twitter files for mass censorship and mass flagging of thousands of accounts. 
But they are laundering. Uh, Sorry, did they Twitter did that? The Twitter files. We did episodes on that where we found out that uh, the Twitter files was a handpicked journalist by uh, Elon Musk. Um, yep. Basically giving them access to only what they had access to because they could only research it on laptops that Musk had given them. Yeah, but uh, from the Twitter files, I distinctly remember uh, part of it was that there are accounts on Twitter that are deemed like too controversial to ban, right? Basically, or too uh, to too, too prominent uh, moderate. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and that was before yeah. Elon. Yeah, that that and <clears throat> to, you know the argument, and I I'm I'm sympathetic to the argument that there are some people who are. Uh, well known enough that it's in the public interest to know what fucking bonkers shit they're posting on Twitter. <laughs> Russiagate affair. You had U.S. intelligence laundering things out to Christopher Steele and, and the MI6 networks out there. You have God. I want to believe in the PJ. The Department of Homeland Security laundering out to a British lab, whose ultimate goal is to create a psychological vaccine against vac against fake news. Do they use those words? They yes. use those words. They have. They have glitzy 10 minute promo videos. They have, they have, you can go on their website and you can see the, you know, hundreds of studies they've done. They just put out one. I mean, really, that's just like critical thinking skills. Right. And I'd, I'd be curious to see these videos and I'd be curious to see who, whose work they stole without crediting them. I'd be curious to see how many people that I'm friendly with on Twitter who they definitely just lifted concepts from and didn't credit <laughs> because that's probably what's going on there. Well, like if you're talking about, you know, protecting yourself from misinformation, from believing in misinformation, what that takes is critical thinking skills and like actively pursuing using those critical thinking skills all the time, which is where a lot of people like even people with critical thinking skills fall down on it uh, in, you know, a few or maybe quite a few or maybe even like very many areas in life uh like eric for example eric weinstein uh I could use probably myself. has reasonable critical thinking skills he just doesn't use them for these specific areas that are kind of his you know sacred cows that he believes in and just refuses to to apply those skills to so I could use myself as an example. Uh, it turned out that the uh, story about J.D. Vance fucking a couch wasn't true. I didn't care. I immediately tweeted to, uh, about, remember back in the, remember like maybe 15 years ago, everybody was running around going, fuck your couch. <laughs> so I, of course, tweeted about that in J.D. Vance. <laughs> because of I mean, he I just did. seems like a guy who would fuck a couch. Right, right. But it turned out that it isn't true. Uh, I didn't delete the tweet because yep. it was a banger. Even though nobody retweeted it, it was a banger. <laughs> susceptibility test which in two minutes you can you can deduce how prone an individual is psychologically to believing false headlines and it's the most ridiculous politically rigged you know it would be a great joke if it you know it'd be a comedy movie if it wasn't a horror you know a slasher horror to our democracy but then they launder this as a scientific finding saying certain groups of people are more prone to believe false headlines well that means the government now needs to swarm around them with a Truman show of different grant pro of you know grant programs to influence the news they believe they can then use this to put pressure on the tech companies to say these are more psychologically vulnerable groups and so we need to put harder trust and safety filters on them this is the sort of thing that you know, we used to call intelligence work you know it, when we're trying to go into a, a region and psychologically prime people so that we would be calling this if you were doing it on your own uh, citizens because you think that they're the subject of propaganda this would be counterintelligence work news narratives coming out of the voice of america or radio free europe something that uh america is known for having absolutely never done right never ever ever not once ever not until covid especially not in like the 60s certainly Many not times. during certainly like never Congress, never publicly. during the cold war at all yeah publicly and uh sometimes in a comically bad way yeah pump money into the university system we'd get researchers to sort of validate something scientifically that would be picked up by cia proprietary media like voice of america and then that would create this sur e surround sound ecosystem within the country and people would believe that and it would redound to u.s interests 
But now it's our own government doing it to ourselves, and that's also preventing experts from even publishing. So this guy would have been against Radio Free Europe. I don't know if people know what that is. The Radio Free Europe was during World War II. <clears throat> the, the, the powerful transmitters were purchased <clears throat> so that uh, information, oftentimes we call it propaganda, from the Allies made its way into the uh, countries occupied by uh, Germany and Italy. I would probably be against that too. Field, because the moment you cross that tripwire, you're now interfering with a government operation. Well, it, and it's preventing it. And we have talked about the collusion as well. It would be one thing if it was Radio Free Europe uh, continued after and uh, was then putting anti-communist propaganda out into Eastern Europe, if I'm not mistaken. Acting alone, but the speed at which the government and institutional partnership is moving right now, it truly blows me away. And I'll just share my story with, with Stanford Law School. Um, a few weeks after I announced publicly I was running for vice president with Bobby Kennedy, I get an email from, from sweet Charlie Munger from Stanford Law School, who has the big conference center dedicated to him because he's such a lovely, wonderful guy. I had sat in multiple meetings with him. We talked about you know, how we we're going to use um, uh, the law school to work with all of these innovative new technologies and energy and ecology. Very excited. And I get this mystery email from him saying, I think you should sit out your conference this year. This is a conference that I helped design, I built, I built from nothing, called Future Law. And uh, it's... It, it, it's yeah, because he wasn't, he didn't want to send the email that says, you're not invited. So he said, this is the, this is the, this is the, when they don't want to fire you, they're going to lay you off, but like, you know, the, the boss likes you and you didn't really do anything wrong, but they're like, hey, you know, this isn't a really good fit. So maybe we could, maybe we could mutually part ways here. And then you as an employee, you need to go, no, 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 you need to fire me. Yep. You actually need to let me go because um, I know what you're trying to do here. <laughs> you're trying to get me to quit and I ain't doing that. <laughs> but she might be doing a version of you can't, she should have, whatever happened to you can't fire me, I quit. Why, why, why do these people not have that point of view? About the last many years, um, it's a legal AI conference that has is now like the gold standard. And, and I have the same role every year um, where I go in and I, I help host a segment called the Lex Talks. Um, but, you know, just very casually out of nowhere, you, you should just sit this one out. And I said, no, I'm not sitting out my conference. That's silly. And then he said, oh, well, now I'm not asking. <laughs> He's like, I'm the one in charge of this conference. That's probably what happened here. Did she go? Mr. Munger, um, I will be there. And he's like, well, no, n no, <laughs> you can't. And, oh, that's and it. Yep. I, I fucking called it. He was trying to, he was trying to be cool about it. This wasn't an, a part of her employment. <laughs> it was a conference. He was like, oh, it seems like you're real busy running for vice president. Oh, I don't think you'd be able to make it this year. <laughs> that's like, that's like a telling you not to go. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> a few alternatives. He says, well, we'll take you off the agenda. You are not to tell any members of the press you are to be here. You know, we don't want anything political. And keep in mind, this is Stanford University who has Obama, you know, uh, Condoleezza Rice regularly on campus. So um, the speech. But are they the keynote that? speaker at some influential conference or are they just like message gets down into actionable form. It makes me wonder if this preemptive cognitive vaccine has already been at play. Because how- But this isn't preemptive. This wasn't before you did a bunch of dumb shit. This is after you did a bunch of dumb shit. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this, this is people trying to rationalize why the consequences of their actions, of the the- monumentally crazy things that they believe and try to spread among people why like the those consequences are happening and they're like well could it could it be because of the the crazy things that i'm spreading the crazy ideas that i'm sharing no no it's because there's a conspiracy where everyone is against me in particular. I'm the target of all of these different conspiracies that are all working against me in particular. And I wonder if for this conference or any like similarly influential thing, maybe they just, if you're running for president or vice president, they're like, we just can't have you while you're doing that. 
wonder if it's, you know what I mean? It m- might be about the things she's saying, but it might also be just that like, they don't want to be seen as endorsing a presidential campaign. Could be that too. Yeah. Cause maybe that's not the point of the conference. This is a conference of legal professionals. Yeah. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Obama has run for anything since, uh, 2012. If I was him. I would have run for the Hills. <laughs> bought a nice big house and just fucking bought a lot of guns and been like hippity hoppity get off my property <laughs> yeah well i'm fascinated at, at that interplay between the, the government and, in, and institutional favors for favors relationship we were we were talking earlier about this bizarre set of twin programs at the national science foundation one of them is called the convergence Ex- accelerated track f program the other one is called the secure and trustworthy cyberspace program and, you know, in the charter documents for, for these programs, which distribute $100 million to, to this web of universities, Stanford, for example, got a, a yeah, joint... Yeah, Stanford's like the heartland. Yeah, yeah, yeah they got a joint this, yeah. $3 million grant for mm-hmm. just for... for <clears throat> oh, they're, 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 they're not going to say it. They're talking about the Stanford Internet Research Observatory or whatever it's called, where they uh, monitor trends of, uh, like, trends of um, misinformation. They're not going to men- mm. They're not going to name it, but I think that's what they're talking about. The gal that, <clears throat> I think the gal that ran that, I, don't, I think she, uh, uh, she wasn't fired or anything. I think she moved on and has been taking a lot of interviews and she seems great, actually. I don't even know if she's mm-hmm. gone. Maybe she's taking a step back or maybe she's taking interviews. Online, you know, uh, mis- misinformation, which was in the public health space and in the you know, political speech space. But, you know, in, in the, doc- the documents, they, they structure it in a really cute way, which is to say, Misinformation is an, is an attack on democracy. It's a threat to democracy. Democracy is defined not as the will of the people and how they vote, but as the consensus of democratic institutions. And so anything that is misinformation, uh, you know, which is basically defined as something that goes against that consensus well, of democratic Well, they're defining it as people, too. Yes. So you could say 99% stuff that they're accepting of, but if you hit that 1%, your total being is censored. Your total being and identity is misinformation. Is that true? I feel like that is not true. Right. If not, like, I I think most of the people whose work I admire, I I would suggest that I don't agree with them even 99% of the time. Because that's a pretty high fucking number, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, I, I'm wondering why she's saying this. Like she can't possibly think that that's true. Like your entire being being censored would mean you're imprisoned. Right. Isn't that what that means? Yeah. I don't know what she, I mean, I think they all there. They, we've been talking about this the whole time on this show since episode one, essentially is the conflation of censorship with even rude, Criticism, like the no rude criticism is just more speech, right? Like, well, like calling Eric a grifter or charlatan or a dumb fuck or saying that he has delusions of grandeur or any of those things. That's not censorship. That's just more speech. Yep. They just don't like it. Yeah. They don't like when other people enjoy the same rights that they enjoy. Oh, they, it's fine until they, until those rights um, are used to criticize them. Yeah. Okay. So you were going to do origin stories. Um, I, at some point got the phone call, uh, you should, your research is correct, but if you don't lay off of that, you will never have a career in academics again. And it's just, it's remarkable when the soft indications that you should stop aren't working because the person is convinced oh no no I, I, i'm it's good but you did fuck off and we went and worked for peter Thiel, so it worked eric just i was trained to think critically but also like i don't think that this happened i don't think anyone's ever said to him like oh everything you your all your geometric unity stuff that's perfectly correct so again he wasn't in academia in any sort of way when he did geometric unity okay so he well, the, whatever he's talking about then like i i don't think that Someone said like, oh, all of this stuff is correct, but you shouldn't talk about this or they're going to kick you out of academia. Right. Like if it's correct, anyone in academia would say like, oh, this is correct. Good work. But like, you know, it, it goes against mainstream. So maybe like talk about it carefully. 
Right. But yeah, or, you should absolutely talk about it. It's correct. It also could have been that his work in mathematics and physics were good, but that he was just a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> right. Yeah. Maybe he's, he's paraphrasing a little bit. Right. I think that that like requires the fewest assumptions based on the things that we know to be true. <laughs> I'm allowed to consider all possibilities and all hypotheses. And then when you're told, well, actually, science doesn't work that way at all. And strangely, you're told, and it's just sort of almost in pain. It doesn't work that way. You can't consider every single hypothesis in science. It absolutely does not work that way. Like, who has the time? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm serious. Science has never worked that way. You know, you're, I mean, like you can consider that there's not any such thing as gravity, that it's all just ghosts pushing stuff towards earth. But like, there's no way to test that. So you can immediately drop it (laughs) and you're not allowed to consider that in science because you can't test it. Right. And you're, you're maybe allowed to consider it, but like you're not allowed to consider it and use the resources of an institution like Harvard or Stanford or Berkeley to engage in the, the whatever, form of spirit research that you might need to do to claim to prove that like i guess the way i should put it is you can consider it in like other things like you can consider it in religion and you can consider it in spirituality but science deals with things that are falsifiable i I think it's more about not on my dime not on my (laughs) dime you can't do that Yep. misinformation democracy am i right that at some level the people are the greatest threat to democracy the official misinformation people are the greatest now. threat to democracy well what is democracy without people i think he yeah i, I think this guy's not a big fan of democracy information yep. democracy am i right that at some level the people are the greatest threat to democracy the official misinformation disinformation and malinformation is what is being protected because that's what goes around consensus that subset of the science that supports certain conclusions is labeled the science and everything else is not so you have this language pro- problem which is we've got to protect democracy from the electorate we've got to protect um, what we're calling the science from science. We have to protect uh, free speech from people who want to share their opinions. And the language is now so completely crazy that we don't know how to have a discussion. I don't know, like, I did not know until recently um, that malinformation was the technical term for information that doesn't go in the direction of the institutional consensus. And I know that debunked, but pre-bunked, I mean, that was instantaneous because I've been pre-bunked 18 times because that's what I do. I thought I was getting into a game. Tell us about the last time. Do dissenting responsible uh, analytic work with these fancy degrees. And the fact is, is that that used to be something you could do. We used to have Serge Lang at Yale, uh, who was one of these great dissenters. We used we had Noam Chomsky, William F. Buckley from the conservative side. We had all of these great... (coughs) So voices. the problem, <coughs> uh, Chomsky continued to work in academia for a very long time. Uh, William F. Buckley. Ooh, gross. <laughs> um, gross. I don't know who the other guy is, but again, it's this great man of history bullshit. Chomsky. I don't know if he, he, I don't know if he would be, I don't, I don't know that much about Chomsky. Um, I did like manufacturing, uh, manufacturing consent, pretty good book. Uh, but, he, I imagine if you, if pressed, he'd be like, oh yeah, I have actually have a team of grad students and stuff that help me with most of my work. Um, they do good work. This is, this is, and like the first guy, what was he dissenting on? Like, was it some minutia or was it like, or was it like, like long accepted models? Was the guy a crank? I don't know. It's like really weird. I, you know, Chomsky's getting old. Um, so there's no, no value. I don't think in, um, him like talking to Weinstein, but Chomsky, when he was, when he was, uh, you know, in his forties or fifties or whatever, probably would have had some pretty nasty things to say to Eric Weinstein. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. It, it, depending on what you're dissenting on, it could mean that you're like, 
your work would just be worthless you know like as as a biologist if you don't believe for example in evolution you can't do most of biology i guess you could work on specific problems right but yeah i mean you're not gonna you're not gonna overturn the consensus yeah but like you know you can't even do the the science because you have to accept biology or you have to accept evolution you can do to understand work. like most of biology you could do lab work and your lab work would be just fine yeah that's what i mean is like you you are relegated to areas where like you know you don't need to to uh work within what we already know you know you could you can just kind of work in these tiny little areas that it doesn't really matter. I don't know. There've been literal creationists who have been pretty prominent biologists. So I think. Yeah. They, they but, just compartmentalize. Yeah, exactly. They, they work in areas where. Well, no, they just, know, they, 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 not, they, no, they uh, just don't take, they don't take their creationism with them to work. Or that. Yeah. It could be that. That it gave America power through cowboy intellectualism, and now that's gone. I've seen firsthand the mechanisms, at least within science, how this works, right? So- uh, Cowboy intellectualism? A great man of science bullshit. Responsible yeah. for funding a, a huge amount of biomedical research in the United States and, and around the world. But it's not even the money that they confer. What they confer- that's like, it's, it's, it's like rose-colored glasses of the past. Have you ever seen the School of Medicine? the past of science that it just it has never worked like that yeah it's great man of history theory yep. or hypothesis or bullshit is a better way to describe it yeah <laughs> the one of the main reasons i was able to get that position is because i was successful getting nih grants right it's a social marker and um the the, the what they do is they send out the heads of these institutes tony fauci will send out a uh, request for proposals with like essentially telling you what they want from you. Uh, th that, that's, the, that's the normal way of controlling. You mean like in conclusions? Right. I, I mean, they won't explicitly say what the conclusions were, no, no, no. but, the, but the, set of, the set of ideas that you're allowed to, to, like, to, to, to say in order to like get, have any chance of getting, getting funding. Uh, and, the, and the stigma goes out wide. Well, like, that's right? perfectly so, reasonable. Like, if you go out there and you say, I need someone to build a bridge, let me know what you guys plan for, for this bridge. And someone comes back and they're just like, you know, we're going to build this entire bridge out of plaster, the whole thing, you know, 500 foot bridge entirely out of plaster. You'd be like, no, no we need yeah, yeah, it's for good reason. <laughs> right. That's not how you build a bridge, right? There are accepted standards yeah. for it. What they're mostly looking for is a track record of, you know, building bridges or other structures properly. And, um, uh, a competitive bid based on the experience. But the other thing that's going on here is that these people, it seems like a lot of these people don't accept that they're fucking employees. This guy is <laughs> yeah. employed, like it, this guy is employed by be... someone, professors, people in academia, not all of them. Most of them are probably just fine. <clears throat> but the, 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 this, the, this idea here that now that you're a professor, you don't have to listen to anybody. Well, like the, the, what, these people should just try getting, I don't know, any other job and see how that works out. Like, the, I don't know why they think that this is how it should be in academia, that you should just be able to like not do what you're asked. I mean, if they can fund all their own research, go for it. But yeah, like it has to be like, you know, regarding these proposals, it has to be something reasonable for them to want to put the funding into it. It can't be just ridiculous, wild ideas that like, sure, maybe they might pay off, but like the vast probability is that they won't. It's like 99.9999999999999% chance that it's just wrong. Like this, this hypothesis that they have is just wrong. <clears throat> Right. Not everything. If you remember in Ghostbusters when uh, <clears throat> uh, Peter Venkman lost his job <laughs> because his research was into ghosts. Well, that's a movie. <laughs> it wasn't real. <laughs> also, yeah. Peter Venkman was sexually harassing his students. So. In the movie? Oh, absolutely. I don't remember that. I think I watched that movie when I was a kid. 
I haven't watched oh, it since. Um, and it's very directed. It's, 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 uh, and it didn't, I don't think it always used to be like this, but like the, the very top of the institution says, here's the kind of science we want you to do. Here's the kind of inquiries we want, we want. And that essentially constrains the set of things that scientists are allowed to ask. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to not get tenure. I mean, I don't want to be on the outside. Yeah, the qualified queries. Yeah. Maybe if we tease that out to, to um, see if it dovetails with what Mike say. It, it, am I reading you correctly that the NIH might put out a proposal saying uh, current um, misinformation about public health threatens the lives of Americans? We a request for proposal. Uh, we want to study how disinformation propagates online that undermines confidence in our medical institutions. And the sure. argument is subsumed in the request. It's saying, how should we do this as opposed to maybe there's actually a lot of dissent and we should be talking about why have, why have many experts lost confidence? If they're going to do that, and I'm, I don't know this for sure, you know, this is just my assumption, but if they're going to do that, I would assume that the thing that they are taking in their, in like the premise has already been established by previous research. Right. <clears throat> Otherwise they would be asking, is this misinformation spreading in a way that is harmful to society? But I feel like, I feel like you're right. I feel like that's already been asked. I feel like that's a, that's a fucking, that bell got rung a long time ago. As soon as the first country started spreading propaganda to influence another country, we figured we figured out that the spread of misinformation can destabilize your society. Otherwise, intelligence uh, 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 organizations wouldn't waste their fucking time doing it. <laughs> yep. Products in these protocols. That's Eric. That's exactly what that, what happens, and it has real consequences for the health of the American people. Yeah. Right. The American people have invested millions and millions, tens of hundreds of millions of dollars, for instance, on prevention of Alzheimer's disease. And for decades, the NIH only permitted uh, hypotheses were from a very narrow range of thinking. Amyloid plaque? The Amyloid plaque. plaque. Yeah. Um, and it turns out very likely that it's not the most likely, it's not, at least not the proximate cause of, of, of Alzheimer's disease, that we, need, we needed other kinds of thinking. Well, the establishing allow. paper, it turns out, was... Who was it that figured that out? <laughs> but for, for a decade or more, if you were in this field, you could not get an NIH grant unless you took that as the main hypothesis you took. You, you well, under, but right? then so next you're going to be questioning the food pyramid or uh, what causes ulcers. Or saturated. So even at the time that we were, even at the time that we were uh, given the food pyramid when I was a kid, the, 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 the books were old and the, 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 the food pyramid was already known to not be really necessarily how everybody should eat healthy. And the... Uh, <clears throat> The cause of ulcers being bacterial probably was a result of an NIH grant or maybe a grant in some other country. Like that was a huge discovery, but it wasn't, they didn't, they didn't figure it out on a podcast. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Nerd humor. <laughs> I mean, that, but that's the, that's the problem, right? So science needs to have people. You, you can't put a scarlet F for fringe on every single scientist that has a different idea. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. Um, it, it just kills science and it hurts the health of the American people. Yeah, we're, we're in a tough situation. So maybe this is a good time to talk about remedies because I think each one of us have been really focused on what are the tools available to us to reseat our standing. Um, I personally, you know, represent a lot of these moms who have intuition about the chronic health issue in the United States. I love States. how these people are comparing themselves to like the, the Scarlet Letter where someone actually was, I mean, you know, in the story, someone actually was like shunned from society and like, you know, treated like an outsider. And they're like, yeah, that's, that's just like me and, and you all in, in our podcast room. And um, moms have been under such incredible, and, and dads, and dads too. It's, it's usually the mom that smells it first, but like, you know, the parents, let's talk about well-meaning parents um, looking for remedies. I know that parents out there- But you're parents, preying on those people. Doesn't she understand that yep. she's preying on those people? They're like, oh, I have an intuition about this, that, and the other thing as a parent, and you're preying on them instead of giving them good information desperate to figure out how to break free um, of the suffering in which they can't access. Unfortunately, the, the victims of that 
isn't the parents, it's the children. Right. Scientist who has written a paper that says, this is what happened to my kid, but that scientist has been, quote, debunked. Um, they have, they're left with nothing. They're left with more of these unexplained illnesses. Uh, you know, oftentimes you'll hear unexplained infertility, you know, unexplained GI issues, unexplained neurological disorder. Everything is now going unexplained. And anytime you try to explain it, you're criticized. I mean, this is, this is absolutely wild. So let's talk about all the remedies that you have. Um, Anytime you try to explain it, you're criticized. I don't, again, I, I just don't believe her. So I, th I, I think, think she's, true. I think she's saying without saying uh, the vaccines autism thing. I think that's what she's doing. Okay. Supreme court case, you're a plaintiff. Um, you are bringing a First Amendment issue. So First Amendment is one that we're all looking at very closely. Uh, constitutional right that seems to be not taken very seriously today. But is, is, that, is, this, a, is this a path forward for us? Yeah, I, th I think that the two major principles are, are we need to decentralize the, the powers of our, the power of the institution to, so that it allows other voices that are on the, that, that now are on the outside in um, you know, voices that have some expertise, but for whatever reason, it's expertise that's challenging the center of power. And then we need radical transparency, right? And so free speech is of a piece of that, of, of, a, of, a, of a part of, like fundamental part of that, right? So what happened to me was that the government decided that what I was saying was so, di so wrong or dangerous or whatever, inconvenient, that it sent messages to social media companies saying, if, if if you have people saying the kinds of things Jay says, <laughs> label them, throw them off, make them make them into fringe figures. Don't yeah. let them don't let them have a voice. And don't tell them, by the way, that, that they've been ghost. You just so they'll think that they're just they're they're, they're seeing things when when they're not. Um, uh, the idea that the government can tell social media companies who and what to censor that was the heart of that case. And unfortunately, Nicole, we we um, we, we had some really good rulings in the lower courts and the, in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled, it was a very interesting ruling. It said that I lacked standing to sue for this case, um, which meant that because I couldn't show an email directly from the government to the social media company saying, send censor J. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it was okay that they went from the social media, the, the government told the social media companies, censor the, the kinds of ideas J says. Uh, so, so they didn't really do right, that. Bobby Kennedy, he's, he also has a case, a very similar case, and he very he certainly has that. He meets that standard for for standing, right? He yeah. He he was just granted an injunction um, in 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 that case. Even if they did, uh, that still is not uh, a violation of your First Amendment right because it isn't illegal for you to say that. They're suggesting, they're asking that a social media company not allow that on their platform, on the social media company's platform. Right. They're not saying we will uh, revoke you your business. Still, we were, they're not saying we will revoke all your license to do business if you don't do what we say, which would probably be a free, uh, it, but the person's free, the free speech being violated would be that of the platform, not of the users. Yes. Uh, and Again, where it it goes back to like you're not allowed to say, or you're you're not required to let someone else say something on your platform. Careful. Um, which, but but what it does is it says the government can't tell social media companies who to censor, but the government can now still under current law, under the current rule, sort of ruling of Supreme Court, can tell social media companies what ideas to censor, and there's no one will have standing. Because there won't be that email. When you eliminate a whole person for one idea, they might have. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> eliminate a whole person? But Okay, so now getting kicked off Twitter is being like your whole person being eliminated? Right. And Jesus. And <clears throat> not, not just that, this guy's a huge social media following cases what i mean we need remedies we need case law we need direction we need guiding light well i, th I think this one for this we need congress to act we i mean because the Supreme court yeah. i don't i've sort of lost a little hope in them well how do we get what party right now do we vote for if we expect congress to act or what 
Right. And you know, that case still has a lot of life in it in the sense that who knows after full merits discovery, I could see it very easily going back up to, into the Supreme Court, although it might take two years. Um, but for, for my part, you know, we've been talking about institutions and reseeding institutions and the role of trust in that. And I do think that institutions actually sort of naturally reform um, as trust breaks down and, and the, the reformation of the institutions is part of the trust re, you know, re, reinfusion process. But that is being stopped right now because the government has capacity built this coterie of thousands of different outside organizations to artificially preserve that what's left of their trust by cancellation tactics and censorship tactics of anyone who amplifies so-called distrust. And so you know, what we were just talking about with the National Science Foundation with these two programs that they have there, you know, they define democratic institutions as government agencies and the media. The media is actually listed as a democratic institution that misinformation endangers, which means anyone who questions official media narratives is, you know, is in the crosshairs of $100 million in taxpayer spending to the Stanford, to University of Stanford, to the University of Washington, to the University of Cambridge for these psychological vaccines. And I do think if you were to get rid of the government's gargoyles that, that defend the artificial gargoyles of trust and the state of play would just be how people feel about these institutions, there would be an organic so, you know, social media wave. There would be an organic response by elected representatives being responsive to seeing that. I've seen this personally dozens of times where you know, change doesn't start in Congress. Congress never doesn't take action until it's already on the tip of everyone's tongues and they know they will be made a hero by sponsoring this bill or by, by forming this investigation committee, which means the onus is on the people to, to put it on the, the tip of everyone's tongues. But Okay, then be more influential, be more persuasive. You know, a North Korea-style mercenary censorship army being capacity built, subsidized by the U.S. federal government to do this. And so I do think if you were to tear down those gargoyle firms, you know, these institutions like NewsGuard and these university centers that we're talking about, and these and this this NGO soft power swarm army, that that those institutions would would naturally recede in you know, reseat. In well, like, you know, if you can't be right, be loudly I vehemently wrong myself, but i think it would be and this is something i very much appreciated um mike saying on, on his tucker carlson interview one of the things that you have to do is you have to understand what's motivating this from the perspective nobody gets up in the morning saying how can i be evil and censor good people on the internet the way this starts be surprised. With some, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> is some i do like nato and the idea <laughs> is that the people in that permanent class inside of Washington, D.C. and in Brussels say, look, there's certain things that are so important to the functioning of the world that they cannot be uh, endangered when you take a pulse every four years of a country like the United States and say, well, where are, where are we at the moment? Because it, what they call a populist is somebody who has not been pre-vetted by the two vetting organizations. The old model of democracy uh, from Millard Fillmore into the present is that there are two parties. Those two parties are supposed to nominate people who are broadly acceptable to the institutions and then all of us get a binary vote which is supposed to express our hearts, uh, dreams, and, and um, hope for the future. That model is in the process of crashing. Now you have is three it? candidates who are leading the field, um, two of whom do not appear to be signed up for the institutional consensus at the level that, let's say, the Atlantic Council uh, wants them to be. So their perspective is, is, is kind of funny. It's like, look, we're all for democracy as long as it doesn't actually threaten the brittle limb on which uh, the Western world sits. And that means that what you're supposed to be doing is explaining NATO as you see it, explaining NAFTA as you see it, explaining you know, trade rounds as you see them, or the WHO, and then you have to put it in front of the people. And the people may say, yeah, I didn't follow that NAFTA reasoning. I understand the NATO reasoning, but I'm not up for the NAFTA thing, and the WHO seems to be under control that I don't trust. Then you have to go back and say, look, we're losing the people on some of these key institutions. What do we do? That is not happening. 
And I think that, you know, in, in large measure, people don't vote based on NAFTA or the WHO. Say, if we want to solve this, is to talk to the thing that doesn't even want to show itself. The thing that doesn't want to show itself is sitting there saying, God, these people go on and on about democracy and they don't even understand how dangerous the world is. Just let us do our job. We have just seen in the Democratic Party a process that is not explained on Schoolhouse Rock where a person suffering from dementia, um, <laughs> clearly visible to people uh, who have televisions or, and, and who can uh, get YouTube, that those that this person has walked away from, from the race, leaving us with the vice president that nobody seemed to want, dropped out super early because she couldn't raise money. That's what she said. There was also that Tulsi Gabbard thing that suddenly nobody can remember. Literally like and 70 million people voted for her as, as the, the VP. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she didn't, <clears throat> she didn't win her, her fucking, but like the other thing is like most people who run for president don't win the primary. Yep. <clears throat> process is is being told to us that democracy is on the ballot well what happens if it's actually democracy and oligarchy that are both on the ballot at the moment right well this is as good a place as any to stop the podcast this is in intensely boring and we're not going to watch any more of this during the post game <laughs> uh yeah that was they definitely lived up to the title, the, the council of the canceled. Uh, they were, they were extremely entitled, which, uh, is exactly what someone is when they call themselves canceled. <clears throat> They're, uh, That's just a big red flag saying I'm the most entitled motherfucker in the room. Also, you have to have platform and privilege to get canceled in the first place. Yep. Well, that's been the show. HK is going to read it out. <laughs> All right. Thank you for tuning in to uh, Intellectual Dollar Tree. I almost said, how the tech are you? Which, by the way, if you haven't checked it out, we do that on YouTube. Uh, but uh, thank you for tuning into the Intellectual Dollar Tree. We do this show every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific on Echoplex. Uh, sorry, twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. If you want to check out our other shows, you can do that on echoplexmedia.com. And if you want to support us, you can do that on patreon.com slash Echoplex or eplex.store. If you are listening live, stick around for after the song where we'll be doing red light, where we uh, continue the show and we change the color of the lights and the contents of our drinks. Uh, if you're not listening live, then uh, check us out sometime. Now, this is Boomers by Periscope.